Yeah, so thank you, Alexander. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and uh, to show you lots of beautiful pictures of what artists are currently doing with, with AI. And, um, but yeah, first of all, just to show in a couple of slides what I actually do, because this is more of a, um, a Python and data science conference and um, you might not be so close to the art world. So I, I run a meetup in London that promotes uh, various um, artistic projects that uh, use AI in some form in art, music, and design. And uh, I curate um, various exhibitions frequently at conferences. So this is one I did in Cambridge um, a couple of years ago and uh, then in London um, last year where we put some kind of uh, AI printed, uh, uh, printed versions of AI generated works up on um, easels. And um, then I also uh, curated a media art festival in the Netherlands called uh, Impact, which, um, which looked a lot at um, some of the critical um, questions uh, around um, AI and art. And um, in the technical community, I'm maybe a little bit known for organizing this NIPS or NIRIPS creativity workshop, which I've been doing for the past two years and uh, which I really hope to do again in December. And um, yeah, if you're working in machine learning and um, doing something creative with design, art and music, you're very welcome to submit papers um, to, to this workshop, provided it happens again. And um, last year, I made a collection of AI art submitted to this workshop, which is now available at AI Art Online. So if, if, if you want to know more about uh, what types of artists exi exist in this space, you can go there and have a look. And um, yeah, now I will ultimately tell you about what artists are currently doing in this space. And um, I always start with uh, Deep Dream. And how many of you are familiar with this? Yes, very many hands go up. And this is very good. I feel I give a lot of these talks at um, art conferences. And there, maybe 10 or 20% of the room put their hand up. So um, it's very nice to show these uh, images to the technical community. And if somebody didn't put their hand up and is not so familiar with Deep Dream, this is basically how it works. So this is an artist, Memo Acton, and uh, he is run through this algorithm that emphasizes the features and comes out with all these crazy shapes and colors. And um, I think at this point is uh, really when this latest wave of interest in AI art has started. And I think it's uh, four years ago now, and uh, when this deep dream came out into the public, um, a lot of people were kind of curious because you can see that it's, it's got its own aesthetic, which can be considered um, artistic and uh, interesting, even if uh, you're not an art historian. And um, in terms of artists who've been working with, with this technique, I, I like to mention uh, Daniel Ambrosi. And uh, he is a computational photographer, so he takes lots of photographs. And um, in this case, he has uh, incorporated Deep Dream. And if you look closely, you can kind of see how um, some of the rocks and kind of the river, they have the, the Deep Dream colors and uh, the shapes. But you can still recognize that it's uh, seen by the river with houses and um, and trees, so the technique isn't too dominating, which is what I like about this example, because I think with these tools, it's, uh, it's, it's too easy to get carried away and make the work all about the technique. Um, and in this case, it's nice that it's kind of in the background and uh, the, the realism of the scene kind of still exists somewhere. And then you also probably saw this, um, also around four years ago, and also probably more recently in uh, the talk that Alexander gave, right? Um, but yeah, uh, style transfer uh, was great for turning various landscape scenes into works 
that look like they were made by Picasso or uh, Monet or like an impressionist. And um, yeah, I think it became really popular with Prisma. And um, I remember when I started going to all these technical conferences and I was telling people that um, kind of, oh, I, I look at this AI art space, everybody thought that all the artists were doing style transfer because maybe to the general public, this was kind of uh, an easy way of uh, making um, a photograph or an image look uh, very artistic. But if I, if, I, if I told this to the art community, then they would be shocked because many consider style transfer to be a bit of a pastiche because ultimately um, with this technique, you're converting kind of a photograph into something that looks in the style of uh, another famous artist, you're not really kind of uh, developing or innovating uh, so much because you're trying to kind of replicate what has been done in the past. So the art community has some criticisms of it. But yeah, there are some, uh, some more interesting examples like uh, Jean Kogan who has uh, rendered M Mona Lisa in uh, cubist, um, impressionist and pointillist ways. And then also he broadened kind of the definition of style to change it into um, yeah, astronomy, Google Maps, and calligraphy. And I think this is one of the more interesting ways of using kind of style transfer is to kind of go beyond artistic style and think like what else can act as a style. And uh, then Sophia Crespo also has uh, some really cool works where um, I think she minimized um, content and um, somehow basically she got these really cool uh, sea creatures. And um, yeah, I, I also like to show you this work because I think it's very aesthetically pleasing. And uh, then came the GAN, so the Generative Adversarial uh, Network. And um, I think now it's very much uh, uh, synonymous with current um, visual art and AI practice because, um, yeah, the GAN models have gotten pretty good. And in the process of getting there, they have also produced some quite interesting results. And um, yeah, here is some works by Mario, by Mario Klingemann that are about two or three years old now. and. Um, you can see that uh, they, I think, yeah, they're very beautiful artistically, so they might remind you of artists from the 20th century like Egon Schiller or uh, Francis Bacon because um, they have, I guess, mashed up faces and sometimes weird limbs. And um, if you kind of followed the GAN developments or have been experimenting with the technology a lot, you will know that like uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there were a lot of kind of issues with um, making sure that the eyes were in the right places and that humans or cats had the right amount of limbs. And uh, this is kind of also you can see how in, in some ways it's also reflected in, in the artistic uh, practice of, of that time. So the person in the middle has a random, I think, arm that's like sticking out at an odd angle and, and so on. And um, Mario Klingemann is a really good artist, I think, to follow because he's very prolific. And uh, every time there was a new kind of GAN model, he would kind of play around with it and also kind of add uh, different uh, layers. And, um, and yeah, this, these are some more images of, of his work. And um, this is one from last year when I think Gans got very realistic and uh, he created some installations that were um, kind of generating very realistic faces. And I don't know if any of you have made it to the Heck Basel kind of uh, museum or exhibition. Has anybody been there? A, few, a couple of people, very good. Yeah, because I went there actually just before this talk and um, I can mention it now because you're all in Basel and you're here listening about AI art. And uh, if you do become interested in it enough to go to the exhibition, then uh, 
Yeah, there's an exhibition around AI art featuring actually some work by Mario Klingemann, and um, there's, a, there's a mirror that you can go up to in front and it will kind of render your, um, your photo based on uh, kind of the, the data sets or, or the people that it's kind of seen throughout the exhibition. And um, yeah, it should be open, I think, tomorrow and the rest of the week from 12 until 6. So that could be interesting. But yeah, back to the art. Um, yeah, the gowns got quite realistic. And um, there were also some artists like uh, Libby Heaney that are interested uh, exactly in, 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 in the techniques because they can now produce such um, kind of high quality and uh, realistic results. And of course, the media likes to pick up on this kind of uh, controversy with the with the deep fakes and with all the kind of um, ethical implications of uh, making people say or do things that they never did. But this is more of a playful kind of version of that. And uh, it's called Euro Revision and uh, it features uh, yeah, two politicians, uh, Angela Merkel and Theresa May who were kind of, I think, dancing and um, also uh, speaking some, some, some poetry in this kind of Eurovision style, also maybe to highlight the current state of uh, UK politics. Um, but yeah, th this is more of a fun example of using these techniques. And Scott Eaton has, uh, has some very beautiful works uh, that I think render the human form in a very kind of beautifully a realistic manner. And yeah, this is also like a short video that, um, that shows his, his process. So he comes more from, I think, the, the graphics community and, um, <coughs> oh dear, I don't know whether I was coughing, but um, <laughs> yeah, you can see maybe this poor person has been sliced apart and then has to cough. But um, yeah, the, yeah this, is, this is a good example of, um, I guess, what, uh, what the technique can do in terms of also depicting the human form. And um, now I will move on to a set of artists who are very much interested in uh, the data part of, um, of, of this whole process. And um, i like to start with Roman Lipski. And uh, he is um, a Polish artist uh, based in Berlin. And uh, he took this photograph of uh, a night scene in LA and uh, then he proceeded to paint nine different versions of this photograph, and this became his data set. And so he fed this to the machine, and um, it generated kind of some images based on his nine photos. And, uh, um, and yeah, these were the images generated. And what Roman Lipsky did was he, he painted uh, some more uh, works in response to those uh, generated um, images. You can see them here. And uh, then these went into the machine again to come out with this, which is um, yeah, quite a bit more abstract. And uh, the color choices are a bit, um, well, maybe clearly not human selected, I think. And then Roman Lipsky kind of painted some, um, some other works in response. So if you kind of look at these, I think it's uh, quite interesting to see how the artist has developed uh, stylistically kind of through the help of, um, of this kind of yeah, AI algorithm. And, um, and yeah, it's also, I think, a great example of how you can use these tools even if you don't care so much about kind of making digital works because uh, a lot of artists are also very much interested in continuing to work with traditional materials and this is a great example of how a painter who's always been, I think, um, quite traditional in, uh, in his choice of medium, he's always painted landscapes and then he decided to get some inspiration by working with a technical team who kind of trained the AI on, on, his, on his paintings and then he kind of proceeds to um, stick 
um, with, uh, with the painting medium. So I think it's, uh, it's a good example. And uh, next, um, there is a work by uh, Anna Riddler called Fall of the House of Usher. And um, Anna is uh, very much an artist who is uh, interested in, um, yeah, in, in her own data sets. And um, she watched this film called Fall of the House of Usher. And then she proceeded to make um, lots of, um, well, not lots. She made two or 300 uh, drawings of uh, black, and white, black and white ink drawings of, uh, of this film which you can kind of see how, how that worked here. And then she proceeded to train uh, pix to pix on uh, her 200 ink drawings to produce an animation. And um, yeah, this is one of the versions, one of the early versions of the animation. And if you kind of uh, watch it through, uh, you will notice that uh, there are certain kind of uh, specific specifics that um, really link this, this work to the artist, like here um, in, the, in, in, the, in the big face, the algorithm um, drew the eyebrows and the eyes in the same way because that's how Anna ultimately draws um, those. And then sometimes you have a chair that appears and uh, reappears because to an artist, maybe a chair is a background element. It's not really that important. So sometimes you can miss it out. And uh, so it's very kind of interesting to watch how, uh, how the algorithm ampli amplifies uh, the artist's um, particularities. And um, like uh, Roman Lipsky, Anna also kind of uh, engaged in a feedback loop with, uh, with the AI. So the first animation was, I think, the one I just showed you before. And then Anna drew more um, ink drawings based on that one, which she then trained uh, pix to pix again to generate the middle um, video. And then she made drawings of the middle video. And uh, yeah, the AI generated kind of this, this last version um, on, the, on, on the right. So you can kind of see how um, yeah, it becomes a little bit more blurry because I think um, each time uh, Anna has uh, kind of less and less to work with. And these are some stills. Um, and Helena Siren is, is also worth mentioning. And uh, what I really like about Helena Siren is that, yeah, she, she also sticks very much with her own data sets and she works a lot with uh, I think her own drawings and photographs, and um, yeah, also with uh, kind of flower and mosaic themes. And uh, yeah, these are some images of hers that I uh, recently curated for a show in, in Switzerland. And um, I think the one on the right, it combines um, newspaper and, um, and photography. And um, yeah, the other one also, like, yes, her works frequently combine different types of mediums that you wouldn't normally kind of see together in, in, what, in one image. And uh, yeah, I, reckon, I definitely recommend you to follow her practice because it's, um, yeah, it's very beautiful in combining these uh, mediums and seeing what beautiful um, aesthetics AI can generate. And um, there's also Yegor Kraft who is uh, an artist not working with his, with his own data sets, but thinking about um, the data sets we have from antiquity, because we have so many kind of um, antique, um, well, sculptures from, yeah, yeah from, from that early period that sometimes have the kind of the noses that has, uh, has, has fallen off kind of through through age or, or so on, or sometimes it's only a fragment that we find. And he thought, like, how can we um, further develop these um, you know, sculptures? Maybe we can use an AI to kind of generate the remainder of, um, of the sculpture based on the fragment. And uh, he did that. I think these are some possible generated versions of uh, 
these uh, faces. And then he also 3D printed some of the um, components and uh, I think complemented them to the um, existing fragment. So these are some examples of, of the sculptures. And um, yeah, now I will look at some artists who look a little bit more critically at, at this topic. And um, I like to start with this one. It's good that you like this one too. And um, it was made by Scott Kelly and Bel Ben Polkinghorne. So these are two guys from uh, New Zealand. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if, uh, if I should call them artists or um, good advertising executives, because I think, yeah, they work a lot in advertising. And um, this was, I think this was an, art an artwork in the end, but it's kind of very witty. and. Yeah, I think it's obvious what it's uh, trying to get at. So this is a national park in New Zealand, and uh, you come there, and then this, there's this billboard that suggests um, the other national parks you can go to, because clearly that's what you want to do when you're in nature. You want to be reminded of technology, and you want to be recommended more stuff. And uh, yes, yeah, so there's another one kind of with the, with the seaside. And uh, also one with the slide. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this one, this one is particularly good because I guess the point of the slide is to kind of slide down it. And if you do, you, do, you, would, bang, you would bang your head on the sign. So it um, clearly shows how uh, technology can also, I guess, hinder your enjoyment of natural spaces if, if used wrongly. And um, yeah, then there is uh, Gretchen Andrew. Uh, who calls herself an internet imperialist. And uh, she is um, very much concerned with uh, kind of what comes out in uh, Google results and whether uh, you as a human or an artist can influence that. And she's got a series of projects where she picks um, a set of words, like in this case, it's Freeze Los Angeles. So it's a, it's a big, famous art fair that was just kind of starting out in its edition in LA. And um, she, she made some paintings, which you can see on the images, actually on, yeah, on, on most images there, against the white background. And uh, she put her paintings in this kind of, um, in, yeah, in a, I think in a generated gallery space to make them look as if they were being exhibited at a gallery. And uh, then she knows how to um, really make search engine optimization work for her. So um, yeah, if you did search Freeze LA at time of the art fair, this is what would come up. So these kind of like imagined exhibitions of, of artwork as opposed to what was really happening. And uh, she's done that a lot, I think, looking at also her hometown and kind of Bow, uh, New Hampshire in the US, and also looking at uh, what comes up, I think, for uh, products for women. So um, yeah, I think it's quite admirable kind of what she does in, in trying to change what is displayed by this huge global search engine, herself as a herself only, um, yeah, one person artist. And this is one of her um, works. And yeah, next I will mention um, Shiv Integer by uh, Julien Deswef and uh, Matt Plummer Fernandez. And um, yeah, there's this platform called Thingiverse, which uh, I think you can use if you like um, 3D designs and printing objects. And uh, these are some examples of the types of models or objects you can find on this uh, Thingiverse um, website. And what these two artists did is they created a bot that made mashups of all these different projects. And these are some of the um, objects that came out. And the titles were also, I think, uh, bot generated, because that is a plastic action car, and that is an open overlord nozzle. These are a bit of, a, I guess, strange objects. And uh, what I particularly find in found uh, interesting about this project was uh, the feedback from the community. 
because um, what this bot was doing, it was kind of creating all these mashups and it would post them onto the website. And I think the website has some sort of a news feed and so it was kind of dominating it. And then uh, you had various sorts of feedback from uh, the community. Some people were not sure if it was a bot or a human that was kind of making all these um, um, yeah, models. And others were annoyed that it was dominating their news feeds, so uh, human projects got less um, exposure. And then the last one found it strange and was happy that it helped uh, that, that, that this person helped with the model. So, um, yeah, very different types of feedback. And uh, although, yeah, I don't think this project explicitly uses kind of anything AI related, I always like to show it uh, as an example of what maybe can happen uh, in the future where you will have a lot of this kind of AI generated art uh, fighting for space with, with artists. And ultimately, um, some of these uh, crazy uh, shapes were 3D printed and they were exhibited in a gallery in the Netherlands and you could vote whether it was art or spam. But remember, this was in a gallery, right? So you're probably targeting a very biased kind of group of people, right, who came there because they want to see art, so they will probably say, yes, this definitely was art. Um, yeah. And now I will look at some artists who uh, think a bit about facial recognition. And we can start with uh, Constant Delart. And that is his real name, actually. And the reason why I say, say this is because this project is called Dull Dream. And uh, you probably remember that I started with Deep Dream, which was all about emphasizing kind of features in an image. So you got these kind of very colorful um, images at the end. And with the project Dull Dream, it's about uh, dulling or reducing the features in an image so they become a bit more blurry. Like you can see this image of protesters that is uh, very blurry on the right. And also same with Trump. And uh, I think this project is still live, so if you go on dulldream.xyz and upload your own photograph, um, this will also happen to you. So um, you will become less recognizable, and uh, this is kind of uh, a way for the artist to look at how we can fight uh, facial, uh, facial recognition, because of course that is a controversial technique that is used a lot in the public realm, and I think a lot of artists, um, yeah, look at it very critically. But yeah, Adam Harvey is also one of these artists, and he was trying to think of what can you do to your face to stop it from being detected as a face. And uh, so he has this project called CV Dazzle, and it's, I think, three or four years old now, so I don't think all of these techniques work anymore because, of course, the technical community has been working hard to make sure that it can recognize faces. And uh, anyway, at a, at a certain point in time, if you had two triangles on your face, then it would be detected. Um, as, uh, yeah, then, then the face would not be detected. But if you had only one triangle, then yes, you would register as a face. And also, yeah, if you had some crazy hairstyle that partly blocked your face, that would also uh, prevent the machine from uh, seeing you. But um, yeah, nowadays, I think a lot of the techniques have improved and the artist has been working with, uh, yeah, with, with a different type of uh, technique. And this project is called Hyperface. And um, yes, yeah, like a camouflage, and I think it tries to kind of blend the face into the background and therefore stop it being detected as a face. There are some artists who also, um, yeah, look at facial recognition in more of a fine art context. And uh, these guys, Sheng Sung Bak, Kim Young Hung, two artists based in Seoul. They found some painters and uh, asked them to paint uh, portraits, which became non-facial portraits. 
So what the painters had to do is they had to paint a portrait of a person together with a facial recognition system. And uh, the portrait had to be not detected as a face. And um, you can see the final results in kind of these images. And then there's also a video that was kind of showing the process. Because uh, yeah, as soon as the face was detected, the artist had to, the painter had to change what they were doing to kind of fool the system and so on. And yeah, you can see some of the results here. And then also here. And whenever like, I look at these examples, I think they're particularly um, curious because the one on the left, like to me, as a human, it doesn't really look like a face at all. So um, yeah, I can kind of understand the machine there. But on the right, I think it's kind of very obvious that it's a portrait of a human. But I guess uh, the eyes, maybe the nose is missing, so or very lightly painted. So it's probably much more difficult for a machine to register that. And um, Tom White has uh, also some great work that looks at image recognition and um, kind of the way that works. And he has a series called uh, Perception Engines. And um, he made some prints that, when shown to most image uh, recognition models, would register in a particular category. So I think the one on the left is a starfish, and the one on the right is um, either a cabbage or a brain. But I get this wrong, because it actually looks like both, I think. But the image on the left is, is a starfish. And I think if I asked one of you to draw a starfish, you probably wouldn't draw this, right? Because the starfish would normally have like tentacles that are like poking out in different directions. Um, but if you wanted to talk to a computer and tell it um, to recognize a starfish from your image, then you would draw that. So I think it's just interesting to, to showcase um, how, how different humans and computers can interpret images. And um, Joanne Hasty also kind of looks at this image recognition topic. And uh, she made various colorful shapes um, that were abstract. And uh, yeah, she got an AI to kind of come up with an arrangement for those images. And these are eight different paintings that she made based on uh, what the AI told her to um, paint her images at, as. And then she ran those uh, paintings through an image recognition model to give them titles. And um, yeah, this, this one became titled uh, Christmas Stocking. But you can see some other options were packet, sock, band-aid, or pillow. So um, yeah, it's uh, maybe a good way to name things, or maybe not. And um, yeah, just to kind of also mention a different technique, um, because yeah, a lot of this has been kind of GAN dominated, and then I guess a little bit of facial or image recognition at the end. Um, yeah, so Harun van den Dorpel is, is an artist who's been working with uh, genetic algorithms. And um, yeah, he was interested in looking at how you can kind of maybe create a supreme artwork. And um, he's, he made some, um, uh, yes, some prints of uh, turtle drawings. And uh, well, actually, some designs of turtle drawings. And then he had um, kind of two drawings that you picked as parents that then produced uh, lots of different designs that became their children. And um, then you could pick the two new parents from the set of children, and then kind of they would create more children. So the process would then kind of continue until they all converge into something very similar. And um, then at the end, the final artwork was printed and um, yeah, displayed offline. So that was also very nice. Um, oh yeah, sculpture. Um, yeah, so I don't think there's been so much sculpture in um, current um, artistic uh, AI art practice. And so that's why I was very happy when there was some work by Ben Snell that went for auction at uh, Phillips, I think, in, um, in April or, or, or March. 
And what this artist did was he got a computer to generate uh, a design of, um, of a sculpture based on a, a big data set that included, I think, old sculpture and uh, also some more contemporary or modern designs. And then he killed the computer, so he kind of mashed up and ground it up into this powder. And uh, this is kind of where the sculpture came from. So, yeah, a little bit brutal maybe, but <laughs> I don't know. I think, yeah, it just makes it special on so many kind of different levels. Because if you look at it, you might not explicitly think that it was AI generated even. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool project. And uh, another recent project uh, called Ida Robot. And uh, this, one, this one was designed by an art dealer in Oxford who actually always used to sell, I think, modern art. So, you know, like Picasso and so on. And then he decided that AI art is the future. So clearly a robot AI artist is also the future. So uh, she's been making some works and uh, I think she can also draw portraits of, um, of people kind of based on uh, facial recognition and then kind of yeah, using some robotics to, to draw that. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's, it's a curious uh, project that highlights how, how trendy um, AI art is now if uh, kind of art dealers are also kind of jumping on the bandwagon. I mentioned this already, but um, I seem to have still left a slide of this here. So yeah, you can go to AI art online and look at more projects. And if uh, you are working on uh, something that is relevant, um, I have a workshop in Seoul at uh, ICCV, so the International Conference on Computer Vision. So the workshop will be on the 2nd of November, and uh, we are accepting papers on uh, computer vision for fashion, art, and design, and then also art. So if you're kind of working with computer vision techniques to create some sort of art, then, um, yeah, you should submit by uh, 10th of August and uh, we'll create another online art gallery um, and there may even be a prize. And if you have uh, any questions or anything, you can email me or maybe ask in the five minutes or so that we have now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, please line up uh, at the, um, the microphones. And while you do, let me start with the first question. Uh, how much of an artist is actually uh, the data set? Mm. Yeah, so I think um, it's always quite difficult to define the artist because um, art is such a broad definition, right? And it can encompass anything from a Picasso painting to like a pair of artworks kind of left on the floor. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you're looking at kind of this uh, generative uh, AI art field that is composed of, uh, I guess, the data set and then um, kind of the technique and then uh, the curation and then also somewhere yeah. along the way the concept, then I think it's one of the stages and uh, it also probably, I think it depends, right, on, on uh, also a lot on the concept and on your technical ability. And yes, I think it's just one of the components. But I think actually an artist might want to have a bias even in the data set. Actually, a bias we try to avoid in data science, an artist might want to have some. That's a, I Indeed. think that's a, a big, a nice learning, I think. Yes, it's yeah. possible. I mean, particularly if it's an artist that draws or paints and they have a particular kind of style, the way they do things, then, um, yeah, maybe they want, like in Anna Riddler's case, to mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of uh, to draw the eyebrows and the eyes in the same way because that's what makes their mm -hmm. practice special, even yeah. though, kind of in theory, eyebrows and eyes should look different. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, can you show the, the yeah, a art gallery? Okay. 
seems everybody's blown away. Oh, Danielle, next question, here. Yeah, come here. Thank you, that was a really interesting tour. Um, one of the things I noticed is that much of the art seems to be about subverting things or taking things that exist and then putting off this kind of machine learning spin on them. So the example of the film, uh, the, the fall of the House of Usher, or the, uh, would you, we, did you like this? We recommend that signboards. So they're, they're, they're playful and they're subversive and they're playing with things that we already know. Even the, the example of, of the artist uh, mashing up his computer to uh, create a sculpture. But I didn't see many that were, that were not of that kind of art, that, that didn't take this ironic and detached stance. Um, I didn't see anything that seems like it will be striking out in a brand new direction in the way that, you know, Braque might have done a hundred years ago or so, or uh, other artists who found a new way of looking at something rather than taking something and playing with it. And, and do you think this is going to come? Oh, wow, what a, what a question you ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean... Tulips, it, maybe. Hmm? Anna's, Anna's tulips, I think, is a, what, uh, it's a positive example, the, the tulips project from Anna Riddler. Um, no, I think actually the project I would mention is, I mean, I, I really like Deep Dream. To me, that's kind of uh, the technique that was really kind of unique. I mean, I haven't researched into kind of psychedelic art or like any, any related movements. So, but certainly I haven't seen much like that in the mainstream. But with Deep Dream, it kind of, there was this very certain aesthetic that was linked to this algorithm. And to me, that was kind of very creative. That was... That was new and special. Um, I think some of the early GANs were interesting too, but they, they did kind of create works that were somehow similar to maybe what 20th century artists did. And um, yeah, I guess in some ways uh, it is uh, tricky in, in, in this field because if you want to become a contemporary artist, then like subverting, um, subverting things or taking a critical look at what's happening in society, in society is what the curators want. Mm. So that's what they will fund and what they will exhibit. And um, yeah, I guess in, in, the, in the fine art sense, or I guess looking at um, kind of, yeah, the, the generative art process, if you kind of have the given that a lot of it is based on, on the data set, which is kind of stuff that has already been done. Uh, so it will create something based on this stuff. So I think maybe if you move away from these generative techniques and use other types of techniques, then maybe you will get something that is a bit different. I don't know. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Lubu, for coming by. Um, yeah, I think you're around. If you have questions, just yeah. feel free to ask and discuss and yeah, throw it sure. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks again for coming by. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>